Hey guys, this is Chris, and in this video we're going to cover a very useful system within computing technologies, and that is the Direct Memory Access, or DMA, system. So let's get right to it. So as a brief outline of what we plan to cover in this lecture, first we're going to try to set the stage and provide some motivation for DMA systems before we actually go ahead and provide a general overview and evaluation of DMA systems. And then finally, we hope to cover or have a brief discussion of the DMA and other related systems that are available within the X-Mega AU microcontrollers, which as we know is a specific family of microcontrollers that we are concerned with for our course. So to really motivate the need for a DMA system, it's important that we first recognize one very common thing that the vast majority of computing applications have in common. And that is, is that at some level, there is generally some amount of data transfer. Now for any given application, data transfer can mean something such as the transmission of a single bit of data representing whether or not a system is to be enabled or disabled, or it can mean something such as thousands of bytes of data or hundreds of thousands of bytes of data or even any number of bytes of data to represent something such as audio or video. In any case though, after we recognize this, it's important that we next establish, well, who is the entity that is actually responsible for performing this data transfer. Well, up until this point in this course, we've really only held the notion, the vast majority of the time at least, that the CPU or the processor is the entity responsible for data transfer. Well, if this is the case and we have a CPU um, handling data transfer as well as the execution of our program, we need to recognize the relevant application may not progress until data transfer is complete. Now there may be interrupts or events that are configured that cause the processor to be interrupted and have something else actually occur in the application, but the main thing that we're trying to establish here is that most of the time applications are have this contingency on some amount of data transfer. So generally we have a condition or a point in our program that we need to wait until either data is received or transmitted before we know what to do next. So with this understanding, we need to further recognize that depending on the amount and frequency of data transferred, data transmission may easily cause a bottleneck on our program execution. So in order to solve this, we want to perform data transfer with some system other than a CPU. So how do we do that? Well, the most common solution is one that utilizes what is known as a direct memory access or DMA system. Now conventionally, I'm going to define a direct memory access or DMA system as one that is designed for the purposes of independently transferring data between two sets of memories. Now also in this lecture, I'm going to use the same term, direct memory access or DMA, to refer to the general notion of using a DMA system so that it's easier for me to write as well as explain a few things. So we have already hinted that the main goal for a DMA system is to remove the need for a processing unit to perform data transfer. Now some other important goals for a DMA system, they're also kind of inherent to this notion of independently performing data transfer, are to re reduce or minimize the amount of time required for data transfer, to maximize the possible amount of data that can be transferred, and to also provide a generic configurable interface for performing data transfer. Now the last one's there because without a generic configurable interface, we would have to individually specialize and specify that when these two systems or memories communicate, they have to communicate with this methodology. And when these other two systems or memories communicate, they have to communicate with this methodology, and so on and so forth. So it would be nice if we had this generic configurable interface for performing data transfer. Well, fortunately, it's often the case that we can implement a DMA interface that achieves all the previously mentioned goals more or less. So in other words, we can normally implement a generic DMA interface that both greatly reduces the amount of time required to transfer data between memories while also greatly increasing the amount of data that can be transferred in some computer system. However, even with this, it's unfortunate because most of the time it often turns out that 
memory components themselves still impose a bottleneck on data transfer. And that's because memory components often cannot perform at the same speeds that something like a processing unit, such as a CPU, can perform at. So with an, um, an, a bottleneck on data transfer, there's still ultimately a bottleneck on program execution due to data transfer. So it's unfortunate. Now separately, incorporating a DMA does also unfortunately generally increase the complexity for both hardware and software designs, although it's not usually enough to be a problem, but it's something to note for sure. Now another important thing to note when, let's say, configuring or designing a system that incorporates a DMA is that to effectively utilize a DMA within some system, the DMA needs to be synchronized with any other relevant components. And what that means is, is that if we wanted to perform some data transfer, one example of synchronization would be that we want to basically control exactly when that data transfer begins. Because otherwise, if we're just performing data transfer willy-nilly, we, we might not ever accomplish what we want for a given application. So generally, it would make the most sense to have some method for synchronizing a DMA system. So with this idea, technically we could say that a DMA is not entirely independent from other systems if, if other systems have to kind of control that system. However, depending on the system, the synchronization technique for this control may not always require something like a CPU or another processing unit. Something such as a dedicated signal such as an interrupt or some other signal that is within the system may suffice to initiate a data transfer or something else that a DMA might need. So returning to the idea of wanting to have a generic configurable interface for a DMA system, it turns out that in general to have this for data transfer means that we have to have quite a few things be configured and specified before we can perform some data transfer between any two arbitrary sets of memories within some system. Now in general, for electronics, when we have this interface that we're trying to make that centralizes these configurations and, and uh, control, we generally implement and design some separate hardware known as a controller for the purposes of controlling that relevant device. And it turns out that DMA is generally no exception to this observation. So specifically in our course, when we're dealing with Xmega AU microcontrollers, within each of these microcontrollers, within this family of microcontrollers, there does exist a DMA system, but it's also controlled, that DMA system has this central control through another system known as the Direct Memory Access Controller, or the DMAC. Now the DMAC, in this course, in this context in general, is a system that provides that configurable interface for the DMA. So using this as a segue, I would like to now for the remainder of this video provide us with a discussion involving specifically the DMAC and DMA systems within an Xmega AU microcontroller. I want to do this because I want us to hopefully better grasp how a DMA system as well as a DMA controller might be implemented in reality. However, if, you're, if you were to utilize this information, please only supplement it with that of relevant documentation, such as a data sheet or a user manual, etc. So as a starting point, we know that the DMAC system within an Xmega AU microcontroller is going to be the entry point or the interface for the DMA system within the microcontroller. But what we don't know yet is that the specific DMA system within a, a Xmega AU microcontroller actually has four separate communication channels. What that means is that each of these communication channels performs this generic data transfer that we've been discussing up until this point. And beyond that, for any Xmega AU microcontroller, each communication channel is capable of transferring any amount of data between any two sets of location in the data memory space, which with this being done via the data bus of the microcontroller. So this means that in our entire 24-bit addressable data memory space, each of these channels can 
send data from any set of those locations in that entire space to any other set within that entire space, even the same, potentially. So it's a very robust system for implementing such a data transfer in a generic fashion. Now what this means is, moreover, is that we're recalling that our peripheral systems within our microcontroller are memory mapped, meaning that the actual configuration registers and the memory used for each system is stored in memory in that 24-bit addressable space. We could use DMA to configure each one of our peripheral systems, or all of them for that matter. Additionally, one crucial thing to highlight from that last slide is that the DMA communication channels utilize the data bus of the microcontroller. This is the same data bus that the CPU utilizes. So we have to recognize that with the sharing of the data bus between DMA communication channels and the CPU, there may easily be the case that the CPU needs to utilize the data bus during a DMA data transfer. I mean, we only have four communication channels for the DMA. We can easily think of an application that needs more than four different types of data transfer. So in these cases, we need to figure out if CPU needs a data bus during some DMA transfer, when does the CPU actually transfer its data? So it actually turns out that it is defined that the CPU has priority in these cases. And after some specific number of bytes have been transferred for the DMA transfer, the CPU will intervene and take over the data bus. Now this number of bytes of data that is guaranteed to be transferred via the DMA before CPU intervention is even possible is referred to as a burst in XMega AU documentation. Now specifically a burst may be configured to consist of either 1, 2, 4, or 8 bytes. And in general a burst is considered in this context and in this system of an XMega AU to be the fundamental unit of a DMA transfer. Now there were essentially two other additional units of a DMA transfer in the context of an XMega AU microcontroller, and they are a data block and a transaction. Essentially a data block is just an ordered sequence of some number of bytes, where this number of bytes is between 1 and 65535. And essentially a transaction is just an ordered sequence of some number of data blocks, where this number of data blocks is between 1 and 255. Now more generally, we can also define or think of a DMA transaction as a complete DMA read and write operation between the two relevant sets of memory locations within our data memory space. Now in this next slide, we see a depiction of one specific instance of the three types of units that we previously discussed. And more specifically, we see that for every burst, there are four bytes, for every block, there are 12 bytes or three bursts and for every transaction there are two blocks now again this is one very specific instance of how these three units could be instantiated or configured but nevertheless it is such an example now a couple other things to note that are mentioned in the documentation are that the specific address within the data memory space from where data is to be retrieved is referred to as the source address and conversely the specific address within the data memory space to where data is to be transferred is referred to as the destination address. Now both the source and destination addresses can either be incremented, decremented, or remain constant during some data transfer and additionally they can both be reset to an initial value after some burst, block, or transaction during some DMA data transfer. Another important thing to note is that for each communication channel within the DMA, data transfers can be requested either directly by the CPU or by a signal available within a set of specific predefined interrupt and event signals. Now this set of predefined interrupt and event signals is well defined within the 8331 manual and can't be altered. Unfortunately, it doesn't include all of the generally available interrupt and event signals within an XMega AU microcontroller. However, there are a good amount of options for the purposes of triggering some DMA data transfer. For an example of such an interrupt um, signal that could be used, 
We could utilize an overflow condition for some timer counter module to trigger some data transfer to ultimately cause data to be transferred at some periodic rate, which could be very useful for a wide variety of applications. Now beyond this, some other notable features of these systems include a single shot or single burst data transfer mode. Now essentially this mode just causes a single burst and only a single burst of data to be transferred upon every single DMA transfer request. Now another useful feature, depending on the application, would be to potentially double buffer DMA channels, and this causes DMA channels to be interlinked, and this can be very useful for whenever there's a need for some continual data transfer for any applications, maybe for audio or video applications or anything of that sort. And finally, another feature to note is that when utilizing more than um, one DMA channel, which again, we only have four, but when utilizing more than one, there generally needs to be some priority scheme to determine which channel is to perform data transfer if multiple are to perform data transfer at one given moment in time. So this DMA system, the DMAC more specifically, allows the possibility for configuration of these DMA channels in regard to priority. So we have actually covered quite a bit of material in this lecture. Um, as a review, we first discussed the general notion of DMA systems and DMA controllers. And then eventually we ended up providing a brief overview of the DMA C and DMA systems within the Xmega AU microcontrollers. Now realistically, there's still much more to learn in regard to DMA systems and DMA controllers, and especially the specific implementation details of the DMA C and DMA systems of the Xmega AU microcontrollers. So in your learning endeavors, please just use this as a supplement for any other information that you are researching and any other trial and error implementations that you design. But I hope this helped, and until next time, I'll see you guys later.